And thank you very much, everybody, for attending yet another LinkedIn.net user groups presentation. And we have our is our thirteenth event now with Winter in association with Winterlect. And tonight we have Jeffrey Richter doing performing asynchronous I/O bound operations. And I'll hand over to him in a little while. But first, just a few housekeeping things from Litnuck. Uh, as usual, I want to thank all of our sponsors, uh, Orchard, Telerik, Pluralsight, and Confused, and our recently uh, joined inner workings to the um, sponsor list for Litnock. And we want to thank all of these guys and corporations for their continued support uh, to the technical communities across the world. Thank you very much, guys. If anybody needs to get hold of info uh, at Litnock, you can get us at info at org. You can also catch us on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, uh, with slash Litnock, of course. And www.litnock.org is our website. <coughs> Some upcoming events. Uh, in June, we have Linux and Developmental. Uh, building rich input forms in HBNet MVC with Michael Kennedy on us on June the 12th. In July, we have our 16th Scott Guthrie open Q&A session. Uh, it is 19 minutes with Scott Guthrie in the hot seat answering questions from anything from his red polo shirts to MVC and service uh, type questions. Anyways, this man is a wealth and fountain of knowledge, and it's always greatly entertaining to have him on board. So it's his 16th event, and he's coming up on July the 8th. Uh, there's also events scheduled all the way out into September. So go to linuxevents.eventbrite.com, and you can see the next 10 events that we have scheduled. Uh, we actually have more schedules uh, all the way up to November in 2013, uh, but they haven't been published yet. Today's uh, talk is Jeff Richter. He's uh, definitely a software developer. Uh, this is his third Linux event. He's also a co-founder of Winterlect. Uh, and you can find a lot more about Winterlect at winterlect.com. Uh, Jeff Richter is a trainer and author, and he's going to be doing performing asynchronous I/O bound operations tonight. Uh, Jeffrey, thank you very much for coming back to us again. Oh, and uh, I'm going to hand it over to you again. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Alright, so I'm going to share my desktop now. There it is, and then I'm going to make the remote desktop full screen. And uh, welcome everybody. Um, let's see, I want to be able to have that thing slide up. Okay, good. So then I can periodically, I can pin this, and then I can see if people put questions in the Q&A manager. So feel free that as I talk to post some questions in the Q&A manager, and I'll be periodically going back to it. Uh, to answer whatever questions are there. Um, let me just do a quick word about Wintelect, uh, which is my company. Um, we're a consulting and training company. This is our 13th year or so of being in business. It was founded by myself, Jeff Proceis, and John Robbins. We're the three technical partners in the business. And uh, we focus on consulting and training. Uh, as I said, we do a, a lot of that for Microsoft internally, but for other companies as well. Um, I'd also like to point out that we are announcing a new service, our Wintelect on-demand training service, where we're going to be now taking all of our course content that we've been delivering over the past several decades, even before Wintelect was formed, and we're going to be recording that and making that available online. Um, the beta version of the site is available now at Wintelect.com, but the big launching of the full service will be on uh, May 30th, uh, which is just about a week from now. And uh, we're very excited, um, and the response that we've received so far has been phenomenal. So I encourage you to go check out uh, winelectnow.com, um, but it, the site will be changing substantially um, on May 30th. Um, <clears throat> as I said, I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Most people are familiar with me from the various books that I've written over the past 23 or so years. Uh, my two most recent books, I show the covers of them here on this slide, my CLR BSC Sharp, uh, the fourth edition of which came out just a few months ago, and there's updates like 4.5 and Visual Studio 2012, and also has some Windows 8 content in it as well. 
The last five chapters of that book is all about doing uh, how to work with threads properly and doing asynchronous programming. So one of the chapters in that book is closely related to the content that I'll be presenting in this presentation. So if you want more information about it, um, please see that chapter in the book. Um, also, we'll have a recorded video, which I've already recorded it. Um, that will be live on May 30th on the Winelec Now site, too. And then um, my Windows via C, C++ book, the fifth edition of which came out uh, several years ago now, it was last updated for Windows Vista, uh, and I don't intend to revise that book anymore. That, the fifth edition will be the last version of that. Um, however, I am in the process of writing a Windows runtime via C Sharp book, and um, we skipped that for Windows 8, but we've decided to hold it up for uh, Windows Blue, which is Windows 8.1. So that book will be coming out later this year, probably around September or October time frame or so. Um, I do a lot of consulting work for a lot of different companies. Uh, in fact, I was on the Common Language Runtime Team at Microsoft for eight years. And in fact, the stuff that I'll be showing you in this presentation with the async and await keywords, um, I was on the architecture team that helped uh, design that stuff. Uh, so, um, so I know quite a bit about it um, and why a lot of design decisions were made the way that they were. So feel free to ask me any of those, uh, any questions related to that. And then at the bottom of the slide here, I offer a bunch of contact information uh, for if any of you want to Facebook friend me or follow me on Google Plus or Twitter or LinkedIn and so on. And then way at the bottom is, is uh, the link to the blog, which, by the way, this is not accurate. So it's winnowlike.com slash blogs. Delete the resources slash. Um, that's where it used to be, but we recently changed it. I forgot to update the slide. And then at the very far bottom is my email address, which um, you are welcome to email me and contact me there as well. Okay, so that's um, what I've, um, the introduction. Um, it looked like there was a question over here, so I'll just see. I see if that's um, not related to me, so I'll let somebody else deal with that. So let me get started with uh, the content. So the problem statement is that threads are very expensive and that when you create a thread, you're allocating a one megabyte of memory for the thread stack alone, then another 12K or 24K for the thread's kernel mode stack. Then there's also a kernel object for the thread, and there's a thread environment block for the thread. And then in the managed world, there's a managed thread object, which has got another kilobyte or so of memory that exists to manage the thread. And so the takeaway is that the threads are phenomenally expensive resources, that they allocate a lot of memory. And so what you want to do to build your application effectively is to use as few threads as possible. Um, in fact, the ideal number of threads that you should have in your application is no more than one thread per CPU on the machine. So if you're running on a computer with, let's say, four CPU cores on it, then ideally you don't want to have more than four threads because that way each thread would be assigned to a CPU. But if you have more threads runnable than you have cores, then you introduce context switching, which causes the performance of your program to deteriorate. And you're... You're just allocating more threads, but you're actually running slower because of the introduction of the context switching. So uh, the Common Language Runtime's thread pool was designed to create one thread per CPU. And so I always encourage people to use the thread pool instead of creating their own threads. And then the thread pool uses its own algorithms for managing thread creation and destruction for you automatically. And it tries to adhere to a policy of using no more than one thread per CPU. Now, it can go beyond that, of course, if those threads start getting blocked. And therefore, what you need to do when you write your software is to try to block threads. By the way, in a 32-bit application, you won't be able to create more than 1,500 or so threads because then you will run out of memory in the address space for the process. Uh, and then your program will get an out-of-memory exception, which you won't be able to catch, and then the program will just terminate. So for server-side applications, where you use a design where you have one thread per client request coming in, that's a really bad design, because that means you would not be able to process more than 1,500 client requests concurrently before the server would just simply crash, and then it would have to be restarted. So that's what all this... Um, asynchronous I.O. is all about. The asynchronous I.O. that we're going to be talking about is all about allowing you to build applications that don't block threads 
Therefore, you need fewer threads in your application, so it reduces your resource consumption. Therefore, it also improves your performance. And for a client-side application, if you have your user interface thread doing any kind of synchronous I.O., then the user interface thread is blocked and cannot respond to any user input. For example, you couldn't offer the user a cancel button where you, let's say, initiate some I.O. operation, then you would like to let the user cancel it. The cancel won't work because the user interface thread is stuck doing the synchronous I.O., so it can't respond to the cancel. So for client-side applications, we want to do asynchronous I.O. operations so the user interface stays alive and responsive. For server-side applications, we want to do asynchronous I.O. so that we're using very few threads, therefore not wasting a lot of system resources, and that allows us to process a lot of concurrent client requests um, in a very high-efficient fashion and with good performance. So let me explain this better by walking you through this slide here. The way that most people build their applications today is by performing their I.O. operations synchronously. And what I show on this slide here is a depiction of a typical computer system. On your typical computer system, you have a bunch of hardware devices or peripherals. Like you probably have a network card. You probably have maybe a DVD-ROM drive. You probably have a hard disk of some sort. Now, if you look very closely at all of these hardware devices, you'll notice they all have circuitry on them. You can clearly see it on the network card. If we took the cover off the DVD ROM drive, you would see that there's circuitry in there, too. And if you flip this hard disk upside down, you would see that there's a circuit board on the other side. Um, what are these circuit boards? Well, these circuit boards are really computer systems. They're very tiny computer systems. They're made as inexpensively as possible, and they are designed for a very specific purpose in life. For the network controller, it takes bytes in, because you plug this into your motherboard, so it takes some bytes in from the motherboard, converts the, then the circuitry, converts them into electrical signals, and then sends them out to the wire that you would plug into the back. For the DVD-ROM drive, the circuitry there would take bytes in through a cable that you plug in the back that also connects to your motherboard on the PC. Then it goes and spins up the drive, turns on the laser light, and inserts at the reflection. And for the hard disk drive, again, you plug a cable in the back of that that also goes onto the motherboard of the PC as well. And then it can go and spin up the head, seek the, or spin up the drive, seek the head to the right location, and then do its magnetism thing in order to read and write bytes off of the platters that are on the hard drive. And that's what these little dedicated computers on each of these hardware devices knows how to do. So let's say that inside your code somewhere, you want to go and open a file on the hard disk and you want to read some data out. So the way that you typically do that is you would new up a file stream in .NET. That's going to open the file on the disk. And then you're going to call file stream.read and you pass some arguments into read. Now when you call the read method in .NET, your thread jumps from manage code down to native code and calls the Win32 function read file. Read file is a very well-documented API. It's been around for several decades now. And in fact, it is probably the most commonly used function of all of Win32. What the read file function does internally is it allocates a data structure called an IO request packet on the heap. The IO request packets may be about 100 bytes or so. And it includes information in it, such as the handle to the device that you wish to read bytes from. So that can be a handle to a socket, or it could be a handle to a file that's on a DVD-ROM drive, or a handle to a file that's on a hard disk, or it could be a handle to a file that's on a network server, too. Also inside the ERP data structure is the address of a byte array where the byte should be read into in memory. You pass that address of the byte array into the read method up above, and it just gets passed down into read file down below. Also, in the IR request package, the number of bytes you want to read from the file. You want to read 10 bytes, you want to read 100 bytes, and so on. And there's some other information put in the ERP structure, too. After read file has created this ERP structure and initialized it, your thread then jumps from manage code or from user mode code down to kernel mode code and passes the ERP data structure into the Windows operating system. The Windows operating system then looks at the handle inside the ERP structure, indicating which hardware device you want to do this read operation against. And in this case, since we want to read against a file that's on the hard disk, the operating system code takes the ERP structure and dispatches it into the hard disk's ERP queue. Every hardware device has its own ERP queue. 
wherever you, whenever you do any kind of I.O. operation against any piece of hardware, that ERP data structure gets created and then gets dispatched to that hardware device's ERP queue. Now, at this point, the device driver is going to pick up the ERP request, and it's going to dispatch it off to the hard disk. So now the hard disk will spin up its head and start seeking, uh, spin up the platters, rather, the spinning, and then seek the head to the right location and start doing its magnetism thing. Or another way of saying it is that the computer has now handed off this request to the mini computer that's on the hardware device itself. So at this point, what about your thread that was running on the CPU that newed up the file stream and your thread that called read? Well, at this point, your thread actually has nothing to do at all. And so what Windows operating system does is it puts your thread into a wait state. So the thread is not executing at all. And in fact, if you look at Task Manager on your machine, if your programs are doing a lot of I.O. operations, Task Manager will report that your CPU utilization is very low. In fact, let me do that. If I open up Task Manager right now on my computer and go to the Performance tab, we see that on my computer I have 82 processes. And across those 80, or 80 so processes, across those 80 processes, there's about 1,400 plus some threads. And what are all those threads doing? Well, my CPU utilization is only 1%. So that means that those threads are only running on the CPU 1% of the time. I mean, now it went up to 4%. So the other 90-some percent of the time, none of those threads are running on the CPU at all. So that, so then what are those threads doing? Well, usually those threads are waiting on I.O. operations. They're waiting for the user to type keys on the keyboard, or they're waiting for the user to click with the mouse or to touch the screen. Or if it's a server-side application, it's waiting for network requests to come in. And this is where the operating system has taken all those threads and has blocked them all so that they're not actually running on the CPU at all. Now, this is actually really inefficient because we have on my system here 1,400 and some threads created, each with a megabyte of memory, and it's really worse than that because of kernel mode stacks and things like that. So they're all allocating all of this space just to sit in the system, but then they're actually only using that memory they've allocated about 1% of the time. So it's, it's very inefficient. <clears throat> okay, so now, uh, oh, and to make matters worse, if you execute this code from a thread pool thread, which I would strongly encourage you to do, I love the thread pool, and you should be using the thread pool as much as possible. Well, if you execute this from a thread pool thread, and then if a thread pool thread gets blocked, because of an I.O. operation, then what Windows does is it tells the thread pool that the thread has been blocked. And the thread pool compensates by creating another thread. So this is particularly bad because we already have one thread that's not doing anything. It's been blocked now. And then Windows goes and creates yet another thread to try to get some additional work done that might be queued up to the thread pool. So that's all very inefficient, uses memory very inefficient, but this is the way people have been writing software since the dawn of time. Now, in the early days, it had to be done this way because we didn't have multi-threaded operating systems, and this is the, and the, the only way you could do IO operations was to do them synchronously. But now that we have software that's much bigger and running on servers and handling lots of client requests, our needs have changed, and our operating systems do support threads, but we have to use these threads in an intelligent fashion. So we're getting back to the slide now. What's going to happen next is the hard disk will finish performing the I.O. operation. And when it does, the device driver will now wake up your thread and allow your thread to return back so that it can now process the bytes that have been read into the byte array and process the data that was just read in from the file. And then your program continues executing. And now your thread is running on a CPU again, so the CPU usage would be higher. Okay, so this is how synchronous I.O. is performed, and it is very inefficient, as I said. So to do things much more efficiently, we would perform our I.O. operations asynchronously, and that's what I show on this slide here. Now, on this slide, I'm introducing the CLR thread pool into the picture, and in order to make room for it on the slide, I removed the network controller and I removed the DVD-ROM drive, but uh, this applies to any kind of hardware device at all. I'm just focusing more heavily now on the hard disk scenario. 
In this case here, in order to perform the I.O. operation asynchronously, we're going to new up a file stream, and I pass in this flag, file options asynchronous. This is a very, very special flag, and it indicates two things to the device driver. When you open a file with this flag, you are saying to the device driver, don't block the thread requesting an I.O. operation. This is good. That means that our thread is allowed to continue running and doesn't get blocked. Because we're not blocking the thread, this also tells the thread pool that it does not or should not create another thread in the pool. So this means we'll be using our, our resources more efficiently in our program. And then number two here, it tells the device driver to put the completed I.O. request packet into the CLR's thread pool when it's all done. And what I mean exactly by that, I'll be demonstrating as I continue with the slide. After I do up the file stream, we then take the file stream object and we call this method on it read async. Now this is a new method in .NET 4.5 that was just introduced. But what read async does internally is pretty much exactly what read does internally that I just showed you. When we call read async, your thread goes from managed code to native code and calls the Win32 function read file. Read file does exactly what it did before, and that is it creates an IO request data structure, and then it goes and initializes it with the same information we had before. Then your thread jumps from user mode to kernel mode and passes the IO request packet down into the Windows operating system kernel. At this point, the kernel looks at the handle in the IO request packet and sees that this is a read request against the file on the hard disk. So it will dispatch the ERP request into the hard disk device driver's ERP queue. But now a beautiful thing happens. Because we specified file options asynchronous, the device driver is not going to block our thread here, and our thread can now immediately return back to the caller. So our thread is allowed to continue running, so we'll continue using our thread, which is good. And also, because our thread's not blocked, and a thread crawl thread will not be created to replace it. So that's going to save more memory as well and allow our program to run faster. Now, the next thing that happens is read async returns a task back to the caller. And when we await the task, and await is this new keyword in C-sharp 5.0 that ships with .NET 4.5, the await operator in C-sharp has caused our thread to return right back to the caller. So our thread at this point returns immediately back to the method that called the method that was newing up the file stream and calling read async. So the thread's allowed to continue execution right up above. However, the code after the await, which is this assignment into bytes read, that does not happen right now. Our thread is allowed to return. The thing I want to be really clear about here is that the purpose of the await operator in c -sharp is to not block a thread. That is, its purpose in life is to not block a thread. A lot of people get confused and they think, oh, well, the word await is like the word wait. And so our thread is going to wait here for the read operation to complete. That is absolutely not true. Okay, the purpose of await is to allow the thread to continue running and to not block. However, the code after the await will not execute until the read operation is done sometime in the future. And that can happen on a different thread. So let's go back to the slide and see what happens. The next thing that happens is that the device driver will take our ERP off of the queue, and it will dispatch it to the hard disk. So now the hard disk spins up, the head seeks to the right location, it does its magnetism thing to read the bytes in from the file. Now when the I.O. request is complete, we go to bullet number two over here the device driver will put the completed ERP into the thread pool. So now the ERP goes over into the CLR's thread pool. And then whenever an entry gets queued up into the thread pool, what happens is a thread pool thread will extract that entry from the pool. In this case, the entry happens to be a completed I.O. request packet. And then it will call back into your code. In this case, it will call back into your code at the assignment. So one thread news up the file stream and calls read async, but a different thread pool thread can come back into your code to execute this assignment into bytes read, and then the next line of code would be executed by this thread pool thread, and that's when you would go and be processing the bytes that 
the device driver has put into the byte array for you. And that is how asynchronous functions work, and that allows you to not block any threads, thereby using fewer threads in your program. All right, so let's see. I see there's one question here. Let me take a look at it. Um, VAR F has new file stream file options asynchronous. I, maybe that was an answer to somebody else's question because that's just not a question by itself. Does anybody have any questions right now? I'll pause for a few. Await by itself does not create threads, right? That is correct. Await does not create any threads. In fact, what await does is it allows the calling thread to return back to its caller. That's really all that it does. Then, when the device driver queues up the ERP to the thread pool, a thread pool thread, which could be created by the pool, but certainly not by await, will jump back into your code and continue the execution after the await. In the example here, the file request would not be off the thread pool. If, for example, it was done by the UI thread, you are correct, right? If, the, if you issue it from the GUI thread, then you're calling read async, and then the great thing is that the GUI thread goes back to the message pump and can respond to user input. So if the user now does want to hit a cancel button, the GUI thread will actually know the user pressed the cancel button, and the GUI thread can do something in response to that. And if it's a thread, if it's not a GUI app, but it's a server-side app, then it would be a thread pool thread that newed up the file stream and called read async. But then that thread pool thread can go back to the pool where it can process other things that are coming into the pool. One of those things that will come back into the pool later is, of course, the completed I.O. request. You would need task.run or something like that. Task.run also does not create a thread, by the way. Task.run really just queues up the task into the thread pool, and then the thread pool decides whether or not to create a thread or use an existing thread in order to execute it. All right, so I've answered those three things. This is nothing over here. What is the difference between begin and end and an async method that ends with async? So that's a great question. Um, the begin and end methods was how you did asynchronous I.O. starting with .NET 1.0. But with .NET 4.5, we have this new asynchronous programming model that is much simpler. Um, and in fact, when you call an async method, a lot of those async methods today, like read async or write async on file stream, those methods actually internally use the begin and end methods today. Now, new classes that are being created and added to the framework class library, they will not have begin and end methods. They will only have async methods. But old classes for backward compatibility, the begin and end methods are still there, but then these new async methods are added because it simplifies the programming model greatly because you can use them with the await, uh, the await operator, which I'll be talking more about as I continue the conversation. Um, what happens if the IO request raises an exception? So if when you call an async method, your parameters are bad. For example, for the address of the byte array, you pass in null. Then when you call the async method, it will throw an exception. Um, but usually that's a programmer error. So usually we don't catch the exception from the initiation of the I.O. request. If the I.O. operation fails for some reason, then the ERP that the device driver puts into the thread pool is a is a completed ERP, but it's completed because of failure, rather completed because of success. And when your thread, uh, the thread pool thread rather, comes back into your code, the await operator will throw the exception. And so normally you'll put calls to await, awaiting an async method, you'll put those inside a try block. Uh, that has an associated catch block, and then you would just catch it. So the programming model is actually the same, um, from synchronous as, as well as asynchronous. If you were doing a space synchronous request, you would wrap that in a try catch block. And if you're doing an await of an async method, then you do the same thing. Just put that in a try block with a catch block down below, and you will catch the failure. I mean, when we were designing this, and again, I was on the design team that helped create, define all of this stuff, uh, we wanted the programming model to be as identical as possible to what you're already familiar with. 
And so if today you have inside a try block a call to read, we would want you to keep the try block exactly the same and just change it to await a read async. And then everything else would be the same, including the error handling. Who queues the response ERP to the .NET thread pool? If it's the device driver, how does it know about the .NET thread pool? Um, so it is the device driver that does that. And how it knows about the thread pool is when you open the file with that flag, file options asynchronous, that is basically what connected the file to the CLR's thread pool. I mean, the CLR team had to write some additional code to do this connection for you. But it's, it causes that connection to occur. So it's really that flag of file options asynchronous that attaches any I.O. operations to that file into the CLR's thread pool. That's what caused that to happen. To which point does the process jump exactly after the await keyword? So I'll be explaining this um, more in this demo that's coming up. So I'll answer the question at that time. What if the async method never returns? Well, then it never returns. Um, so if the I.O. operation never completes, then the next line of code never executes. But that's the same thing that happens synchronously. Right? If you make a synchronous request out to some network server and the network server never replies, now your thread is stuck indefinitely in the kernel waiting for that server to reply. So it's really no different. Um, except in this case, you get the thread back. When you do it asynchronously, you get the thread back. It's just that the next line of code won't execute. When you do it synchronously, you never get the thread back ever, and the next line of code also doesn't execute. Also, isn't the async and await are optimized for multi-core processors than begin and end API of the early .NET framework, assuming the async works off the thread pool as opposed to threads directly? Uh, no, that is not true. The async and await, you know, the async and await has nothing to do with multi-core processors at all. Um, they simply let the thread return back to the caller. That is all they do. There's nothing in there about multi-core processors. The thing that handles multi-core processors is the thread pool itself. And a sync and await really don't have anything to do with the thread pool. A sync and await just let the um, the thread return back to the caller, and then the device driver queues the completed ERP to the pool, and then the thread pool from the pool comes out and executes your code. Um, how would we write code if we wanted, say, five methods returning task objects to run in parallel? and then have some code run after all of them complete when using async and await. So let me be really clear about this. Um, there are two kinds of asynchronous operations. There's asynchronous compute-bound operations where you need the CPU to execute code, and then there's I.O. operations where the CPU doesn't do anything at all because it's the computers on the hardware devices that do the work. So to go back to your question, how would you write code if you want to say five methods returning task objects to run in parallel? So that question as stated is very vague to me. Do you want code to run in parallel or do you want IO operations to be executed in parallel? So, um, and the way that you would do that is very different. If you wanted code to execute in parallel, then you would queue up three or five tasks because you want five of them here, you would queue up five task objects into the thread pool, and the thread pool would execute them as best as possible, which, by the way, would not guarantee that they run in parallel, but you don't want five of them running in parallel if you're on a computer that only has only two CPUs. If you only have two CPUs, then you want only two of them at a time to be running in parallel, because otherwise you'd have context switching and they would run slower. If it's I.O. operations that you want running in parallel, then you could call five async functions, one right after another, boom, 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 get the five tasks back from them, and then you call a function that I would get to later in the slide deck called task.whenall. And then the next line of code won't execute until the five I.O. operations have completed. So you really need to think in your head, are you doing I.O. operations or are you doing compute-bound operations? And then you have to write your code differently depending on whether you're doing compute or I.O. Uh, okay. And then, boy, a few more questions. All right, I'll take these three. Don't ask any more, and then I want to move to my demo. Um, if a different thread 
And then I'll, I'll take some more questions a little bit later on, though. But I want to make some forward progress. If a different thread executes a code after the await, do we need to be careful about using thread static along with await? Oh, absolutely. The answer to that is yes. Um, thread local storage is actually a horrible technology, truly awful. And with the way that people are architecting software today to use thread pools and asynchronous I.O. operations and tasks, thread local storage doesn't work well with any of that at all. So I would strongly encourage you um, to avoid thread local storage as much as possible. Can you specify a timeout on an I.O. operation? Um, unfortunately, that is not built into the .NET framework today, how to do that. Um, in my book, though, I do show in that in the chapter, um, I forget, that's chapter 25 or 26, something like that. I do show how you can write a, a cancel method that you can use. So you can say read async, uh, parentheses, and then die, cancel after, and then, or with cancellation, and then you can add a timeout value, and I show you how to wire all of that together. Um, but it's not built into the .NET today. I believe that in a future version of the .NET framework, cancellation will be built in thing, but you can add it today yourself. It's not hard to do. And in my book, I show you how to accomplish that. And what is the best practice for async await? Should it be applied to I.O. only, or can it be applied to any business logic? Async await was designed for I.O. operations. The task class and the task parallel library stuff that was introduced in .NET 4 was designed for compute-bound operations. Um, a lot of times people use the task stuff in .NET 4 for I.O. operations, and that is a horrible way to use it. It is very inefficient to do that. The async await was designed for I.O. operations. Could you use async await for doing computation? Yes, you could, but it would be... Um, it's awkward, but I would have to think about it a little bit more to really see if you're, for sort of the scenario that you might have in mind, if that's a good scenario. But it was not what it was designed for. Okay, I can tell you that, but maybe it could be used in that way. All right, so now, let me go and do a demo for you in Visual Studio. Uh, right over here. And then I can demonstrate a little bit better how this is actually works. Okay, so here I am in Visual Studio. We don't need this, or this window, or this window, or even this window. So I'm just going to get some rid of some windows here so that we can focus on the code. And it's interesting. Okay, now I'm going to be hitting F11, and here I am inside this function over here, which I just called from main. This happens to be a console app, by the way. And here you'll notice at the top that I'm currently executing on the main thread. Uh, and then I'm going to, in fact, call environment get current manage thread ID, which will give us the, this is the Win32. In Windows, every thread has an ID, and this is the Windows ID of the calling thread. In the common language runtime, every thread is also assigned a managed thread ID. And here we can see the managed ID is the number nine. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, or what I did actually a little bit earlier on, Oh, wait, I stepped over my code. Let me start this over again. Start this demo over again. Sorry. Um, let's shift that. There we go. Okay. All right, now I'm stepping into this function. All right, so now I'm in this function, and if we look at the ID of the thread, it has an ID of 10. Okay, so this is our main thread, and it has a managed ID of 10. Just kind of remember that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this function HCP length async. So I'm going to step into it because this was a function written by me. And now I'm in this function. Now inside this function, I say, so what thread are we on now? And of course, it should be no surprise to you that we're on, here it is, ID 10. So it's the same thread, right? When a thread calls a method, it is the same thread that's calling that method. So this just proves we're still on a thread whose ID is 10. Now, inside this method, I knew up an HTTP client. This is the new class that ships in .NET 4.5, which is the recommended class that you use for doing HTTP requests, and it is recommended that you now avoid using the older HTTP web request class. This method, or class, HTTP client, has a method on it called getStringAsync. 
Now, what this async method does is it creates an IO request packet and it sends it down to the device driver. In fact, that's what all async methods do. Okay? All async methods create an IO request packet, send it down to the device driver, and then they return a task. Right? That is what all async methods do. So this is going to create an ERP, send it down to the driver, and return a task back. In fact, you can see it returns a task of string. Now, by definition, when you get back a task object, a task object is an object that represents an operation that will complete in the future. That is by definition. Okay, by definition, a object, a task object, represents an operation that will complete in the future. So that's what we get back when we call an async method, is a task object. Now, in this case, it's a task of string. And what that says to you is that when this operation does complete in the future, what it will give back to me is a string. Right? And that's, of course, because I'm calling get string async. So it returns a string. All right, so now I'll hit F10 to execute this. So that always returns immediately. Okay, the same thread returns immediately. And in fact, you can see at the top here, we're still on the main thread. Now I await a task. And when you ever use the await operator in C-sharp, first of all, you can only use it in methods that are marked as async methods. Otherwise, you get a compiler error. This was mostly done for backward compatibility reasons. The compiler could have figured it out and didn't strictly need the async modifier applied to the method signature itself. But uh, for backward compatibility reasons, we decided to make this mandatory. Um, and the reason is somebody could have had a variable called a weight, right? That could have been the name of a variable inside their code. And now if we make a weight a keyword, which it never was before, that would now break code. But you could never have a method marked as async before. So if we say now that you mark the method as async, then we know that a weight is the operator and it can't refer to a variable. And that was the reason for that. So... Um, you have to mark a method as async. That allows you to use the await operator inside it. And on the right of the await operator, what you always put here is a task. Now, I say always. That's not 100% true. It does not always have to be a task that's on the right-hand side. But it is a task way more than 99% of the time. So it is almost always a task that's being passed here. Now, I am passing here this task. But you'll notice in my comments that I said what, ha what gets returned here is a task of in 32 not a task of string. That's because this method of ACP length async is prototyped as returning a task of in 32 Now, I told you earlier that when we await, this allows your thread to return back to the caller. Well, the method that's calling ACP length async is expecting to get a task of in32 back because that's what HTTP length async returns. And so this await operator actually causes a task of in32 to be returned back to the caller. So then you might say, well, who allocated that then? That has to be allocated somewhere so it can be returned back. The compiler is doing that for you. When you declare a method as being async, the compiler modifies the code of this method. And internally, the compiler generates code that will create a task of in 32. And it will initialize it. And then the await operator here causes the compiler to return that object back to its caller. So that this code up here will actually get back the task of in 32. Now, if I hit F11, to step over this code to get to the next line, watch what happens. Our thread actually returns back to the back to the caller. Right, so this is showing you that the main thread here has returned back to the caller, and I hit this debugger break. Now, if I hit F11 again, and we look at the ID, it's still ID of 10. Right here, you can see it's still ID of 10. So this proves that the thread returned back when we got to the await operator. Now, the next thing I'm doing in this code is I'm going to take this task that came back, the task of in32, and then I want to go and get the length out of it. 
But this task represents an operation that will complete in the future. It may not be done yet. So I need to await for it to be done. Now, this is how you can forcibly stop a thread or block a thread waiting for an asynchronous operation to complete. You take the task, you call get a waiter on it, and then you call get result. And what this says, I want the result, but it can't give you the result until the operation is done. And so what ends up happening here is it ends up blocking the calling thread until the result has come back. By the way, we strongly discourage this, okay? So um, we don't want you blocking the thread. In fact, the whole purpose of this infrastructure is to not block a thread. So we don't want you calling get a waiter and get result, which would then block a thread. But I'm doing it here for demonstration purposes, so I can show you at this point the thread will block until it's able to give me back the length. Um, also, there are occasionally times where it is useful to block a thread. Um, and I'll mention some of those a little bit later on. I see, it looks like there was a, was a question here. No? Over here, maybe? Okay. So, I'm now going to hit F10 to execute this line of code. But watch what happens. We have a task cancel exception. So what happened was I talked, I spoke too long. And so my device driver timed out my network request. That's a bit of a bummer. So let me do this. I'm going to rewind up to here, and I'm going to execute it again. Okay. But this time I won't talk too long. Okay, so now, notice that we hit this breakpoint over here now. Um, after the assignment to text. By the way, if I hover over text, you see it does get the string back. But what's really interesting here is this. Look at the top. I'm not on the main thread. I'm on a worker thread. So this is proving that a thread pool thread has come into this method now and has executed this assignment and has hit this breakpoint. Furthermore, if we go and get the ID of this thread, we see it's ID 16. It's not ID 10. So clearly, this is a different thread that has come into this method. Now... I'm going to return from this method text.length. Well, let's think about that for a moment. I am returning an integer from this method, but this method is supposed to return a task of integer, right? Not an integer itself. Furthermore, I told you earlier that we returned from this method at the await call. So who are we returning to here at the bottom of the method? So what this really means is when you are returning a value from an async method, what you're really doing is you're setting the result of the compiler-created task object. Remember, the compiler has created a task of int32, and it returned that task of int32 here. So what this return statement is really doing is it's setting the value in this task of in 32, which is causing that task object to now be completed. That causes, the completion of the task object causes an item to be queued up into the thread pool. And then a thread pool thread would go and execute this code over here, except we didn't await this. And because we didn't await it, uh, that's not going to happen. And instead, the main thread's just going to return from here. And then when I hit F10 to execute this return statement, now this thread pool thread is going to return from the method, but return back to where? It's going to return back to the pool, where it can go and do something else. But now you'll notice my main thread has awakened here, and it got back the length, which is 1,020 bytes, and then we hit this debugger break over here. So this is showing you the how you structure your code, and normally everything I'm telling you here, normally you don't have to think about it. Normally you think, well, I want to write a method, and in this method I want to issue an I.O. operation. Then I want to await that operation. Then this code will execute when that I.O. operation is done. Yes, it's true that this code executes on a different thread than this code up above, but usually you don't care about that. 
If you're using Fred Local Storage, then you would care about it. And maybe some other things, you would care about it. But usually, you would not care about that at all. It doesn't matter that one thread executed this and that a different thread executed this down below. Normally, that shouldn't matter to you. Um, but the goal here is that no threads are blocked in the making of the program in order to pull this off. All right, so let me pause for a few questions. Do you have any questions anybody want to ask? I am see many places where people call method async wait in services, not in UI code. I guess that's generally not a right thing to do. That is correct. So in my opinion, wait should never be called ever except for demonstrations and experimentation to see behavior of code. But calling wait on a client-side app is certainly going to freeze the GUI. Calling wait on a server-side app is going to block the thread pool threads, and that's going to cause your resource consumption to go up. So in my opinion, aside from for testing and experimentation, wait should never be called ever in any program. Could you give some guidance on when it's okay to call wait? Well, I think I just did. Never would be my guidance. Sorry, API specifically expecting you not to so you're done. So there you have it. It should never be called. Um, if first async function were in a UI thread, how would I go about retrieving the result of task and it's displaying it in the UI? Oh, well, that's really easy. So what you would do normally is you would await this task, exactly what I showed down below. And then when the result came back, you would go and update the UI. So I put this here because it's a console app, right? My demo is a console app, and in a console app, if I don't block and I let the thread return from here, then it would return back to main, and I have some more methods here, and those would then execute. But if I didn't have more methods here, then this would return immediately from main, and Windows would terminate my process, and we could not want that to happen, of course. But if you were in a GUI app, all you would do is just whenever you got a task back from calling an async method, you would just await that task, and then below it, you would have the code to update the UI, and then you'd be golden. That's all you would need to do. It works out great. Um, something is happening here with the painting of this. So is there an equivalent way to achieve the same functionality and performance using traditional code? I found this new approach a little obscure in our approach. The answer is no. That's not possible at all I'm, without more complicated code. So this is this new stuff that we added in .NET 4.5. The purpose of it is to simplify the code. You could do this in the past with .NET 4 and earlier, calling the begin and end methods, but that made the code significantly more complicated. This is what we have done to make the code practically as um, simple as the way you would normally do it. It would be hard to improve on this um, any more than what it currently is. There's no way you could do it with simpler code than this. That would be impossible. Does the text local variable live on both thread stacks somehow? Um, so the answer to that is logically yes, uh, physically no. Um, and I will be demonstrating momentarily in the slides um, how we resolve that problem with the local variables. Okay, so the local variables are logically on the two thread stacks, but physically they're not on any thread stack at all, and I'll explain how that works in a moment. If the lines following an await call can be called on an arbitrary thread, won't that cause problems if we attempt to update your controls? Uh, yes, it would, but we have done something else special for you. Um, which I don't think I'm going to have time to get into, so I'll say what it is very briefly. If the calling thread is a GUI thread when you call await, so if a GUI thread is calling this code and we get to the await operator, then we have done some special work to ensure that the code executing it will also be the GUI thread. So really what happens is the I.O. operation completes, then a thread pool thread wants to execute this code, but instead the thread pool thread calls begin invoke on the GUI thread to tell the GUI thread to go and execute the code. Therefore, any code you have in here that updates the UI is guaranteed to work successfully, and the UI will be updated. But that is because of additional work that we did when we were architecting this feature and building it into the platform for you. 
Um, if it was Windows for project with UI thread, and a continuation would run on the UI thread and not the thread for one you showed, right? Yeah, that is correct because there's additional work that we did. So by default, it is a, GUI, a thread full thread that comes up, but then the thread full thread tells the GUI thread to execute the next line of code. Um, what is the value of ID2 on the return to await? Right over here. So this would have the value of 10 in it, but then it would actually go away. It would go completely out of scope, ID2. Um, if you wrote code over here to look at ID2 after the await, it would still have the number 10 in it because it's really just an integer that we're loading with the number 10. And that integer would have that value across the calls, of uh, across await, right, across the await call. Why is task a horrible option for I/O operations in your you mentioned earlier? Well, the reason is because that if you newed up a bunch of tasks, in .NET 4.0, and then those tasks issued I.O. operations, then you're causing thread pool threads to then do those I.O. operations in a blocking fashion because they're synchronous I.O. operations. That means you're creating a bunch of threads, which is not free. That allocates a lot of memory and takes time. And then those threads block on I.O. operations, which means they're not allowed to run. And then because those threads are blocking, the thread pool has to create additional threads to replace them. And so your memory consumption skyrockets when you do that. That's why it's so horrible. The memory consumption goes through the roof. And your CPU utilization stays minuscule small because you're not actually using the CPU to do any real work while the I.O. operations are occurring. That's why. Did I answer all of that? Also, what is the best option for multi-threaded I.O. operations on .NET 4? In .NET 4, the best thing you had was to call the begin and end methods. Begin, read, end, read. Begin, write, end, write. Um, is what you, is the best thing for you to have done on .NET 4. So that you didn't block threads and you aren't creating more threads. Where can we download your slide source code? Um, we don't have that posted and I'll have to work that out with the list of people. Um, later to figure out how to make that work. Does task represent a thread full thread internally? No, not necessarily. A task is an object that represents an operation that will complete in the future. Um, how that operation completes depends on the operation. If it's an I.O. operation, then it's really the device driver that does the completion. If it's a compute bound thing, then it's when the method that's doing the computation returns. is what causes the task to be, to indicate that it's now complete. Okay, so let me go back to the slides now. Um, on the slides, I don't, the next couple of slides, I explain what the compiler is doing for you in order to make this work. It is rather complex, and I'm going to go through it very briskly here because we don't have a lot of time, and I'd like to get to some other things that you can do with this feature. Um, but I do describe it in great detail in my book, um, and on the and the video that I created for Winter Like Now, we'll also go into it in more detail as well. So you write your code like this, okay? So typically you say await, and then you call some method that returns a task. Um, if you write your code like this, it is equivalent to you calling the method that returns a task, and then you awaiting the task down below. And when you write your code with this async modifier on the method, that tells the compiler to turn your method into a state machine. The compiler really takes the code that you wrote it and really changes it very significantly and converts it into a state machine that can be suspended and resumed. Now, on this slide and the next slide, I show what that compiler transformation looks like. But in, again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through it in great detail. Very briefly, the method that you write, the compiler changes its code that goes and creates this task object. So this is the code that creates the task of in 32 because that's what we said our method is going to return, the task of in 32 So the compiler has to generate the code for you that's going to create that task. And then it has to return it back to the caller, too. So the compiler writes that code for you as well. The compiler also took your method and converted it into a structure, actually. Your method gets converted into an entire structure. 
And any local variables and parameters that you had in your method, those parameters get turned into fields of the structure. And then one thread can access this structure, but then another thread can also access this structure. And that's what allows your local variables to be accessed by different threads at different times. It's because they really become fields of a structure that different threads could access. Then the compiler takes your code and then puts it into a method called move next, which is a method of, that is a member of that structure. And the code in blue that I show in here is the code that you wrote. And then all the other code that's not blue is code that the compiler has generated for you automatically. So you can see that when you call your method, your async method, like get string async, that returns a task. The compiler calls get a waiter on it for you automatically. This is what the await operator does. When you await a task, the compiler calls a get a waiter method on that task for you automatically. That gives an awaiter back, and then they can use the waiter to see if the operation has already completed or not. If the operation did not complete synchronously, then they say to the device driver, when the ERP is complete, go and call the move next method again, which goes and calls this method by a thread pool thread in the future, and then they return immediately from this function here back to the caller. I mean, really, this return statement goes back to um, here, this method, which returns the task back to the caller. So that's how the caller gets the task of N32 back over here. Then in the future, thread pool threads can go and call this method, and then they can go and get the results from the awaiter out of here, or that will throw an exception if the I.O. operation completed, and then some other thread is now executing this code over here. Okay. And that's uh, the short version of what the compiler does to, um, you know, to your source code in order to make this whole mechanism work for you. All right, that's a very fast version of that. Let's see what questions we have queued up here in the pool. Um, if I read the TPL of the task object, is part, is part of is based on the thread pool. Isn't that accurate? So, sort of. And if you were using in .NET 4 and you were creating tasks, when you call start on a task, that causes the task to be put into the thread pool. But it's actually the action of calling start on a task is what attaches it to the thread pool. Just newing up a task, it just creates a task object in memory. There's no association with a thread pool at that time. But when you say start on a task, that's when the association of the task with the thread pool begins. Okay. Um, begin and end and await use I.O. completion ports under the hood while using a task uses a thread pool that does a blocking I.O. call. Is that right? So... Technically, no, that's not completely accurate. So begin and end and async methods, read async, write async, they are using an I.O. completion port under the covers, but the async methods return a task. But that task will now be associated with the I.O. completion port because it's an I.O. operation. Using a task and calling start on it, choose it up to the thread pool, which does not involve an I.O. completion port. All right, so tasks can be associated with I.O. completion ports or not, depending on how they're consumed. Just the task itself does not mean it's associated with a thread, doesn't mean it's associated with a thread pool, doesn't mean it's associated with an I.O. completion port. It's how the task is used. So remember, a task really means just an object that represents an operation that will complete in the future. How, you, how that task knows when it's done and how the task that it represents gets done is unrelated to the task, right? That depends on what you call, I mean, start on the task or whether it's an async operation or something like that is what affects that, okay? Don't, um, don't confuse all the concepts together because then it will really make understanding how this works much more complicated. Can I talk a little bit more about the book you mentioned earlier? What is the name and where can I get it? I'm a fan of your earlier C-sharp and CLR books. Well, that's the book. So the book that I'm talking about is my CLR via C-sharp book. Um, in the third edition of that book, I added many chapters related to threading. In the fourth edition of the book, 
I revamped those chapters substantially to cover all of this new functionality that was introduced in .NET 4.5. Um, where you can get it is anywhere, um, Amazon, O'Reilly website. Um, the book is available from, you know, your fire bookstores in your local area, and some of you might pick it up locally. Um, it's also available in electronic form if you go to O'Reilly as well. Does Parallel 4 use tasks in async UA internally? Um, Parallel 4 does use tasks internally, but it does not use async await internally. It is for doing compute operations in parallel. It is not for doing I.O. operations in parallel. Um, because it was designed in .NET 4.0 and in .NET 4, tasks were only for compute-bound operations, not for I.O.-bound operations at all. If you want to do parallel I.O. operations, then you should call async method, async method, async method, and then call await task when all, and I'll, I'll be demonstrating that momentarily in the slides. I have a slide on that. To do async database operations using async, is it possible what needs to be provided? Yes, it is possible. The SQL command class has a bunch of new async methods that were added on it in .NET 4.5, and I have those on a slide later on so I can show you those. If I'm using TCP listener on a server app and I get a socket, which is then used repeatedly for a dialog, I know I can use accept socket async, but do I need to handle all subsequent operations with async? Um, it's I.O. operations that you want to do asynchronously, right? The Any operation that is not an I.O. operation, um, or another way of saying it is this way, right? So any, in .NET 4.5, any class that has a method on it that does an I.O. operation, that method has an async method. So there's read async and there's write async and connect async and so on. If on the class there are methods for which there is no async equivalent, then those methods do computation. They don't do I.O. So that's one way you can tell. If you see a method that ends with the word async, you know that method does an I.O. operation. If you see a method that does not have an async equivalent of it, then you know that method does a compute operation. It doesn't do async at all. Okay. We'll be speaking about exception handling later on in the webcast. Well, I kind of spoke about it earlier because somebody asked. Really, the exception handling story doesn't change. Nothing is different. So all you need to do is just put your await inside a try block with a catch block down below, and if the I.O. operation throws an exception, then you'll just catch it. So the way you would normally write the code is still the way that you would write the code today. Nothing has changed there. Couldn't get the latest version of your book. Is it the fourth edition? Yes, the latest edition is the fourth edition. All right, so now let me go back to the slides. Um, again, very briefly here, this slide is really mostly for reference. Um, there are some limitations with asynchronous functions. You cannot mark your main method as async. You cannot put async on a constructor. Um, property getter and setter methods cannot be marked as async. Event add and remove methods cannot be marked as async. The reason for all of this really goes back to this next sentence I'm about to say, which is very important. When you mark the method as async, the return type of the method must be a task. Because think about it. You're saying that this method does its work asynchronously. So therefore, you need to return an object that indicates an operation that will complete in the future. And in .NET, the way you do that is with a task. So async methods must have a return type of task. So your main method can't return a task. Your constructor can't return a task. You cannot have a property whose get and set methods return tasks, because set methods always return void, so they can't be async. Event add and remove methods, they always return void. You can't change that to return a task, and so those can't be async. And so any method that cannot return a task cannot be marked as async. Uh, so there are some other limitations on async methods. They cannot have outer ref parameters. You cannot do an await in a catch or a finally or an unsafe block, but you can do a wait in a try block, and that is very commonly done. Um, it is the most common case, in fact. You cannot do a wait in a lock that has thread ownership, um, like with C sharp's lock statement or calling monitor enter or monitor exit. Um, but instead, what you should use is semaphore slim's wait async. 
And if you're using language integrated query, in a query expression, a weight can only be able to use in the first collection expression or a collection expression of a join clause. And I don't want to go into that in more detail. I'd rather get into some other um, cool scenarios here. How am I doing? 11.13? So I only have about 15 minutes left to go. Um, this, this example here demonstrating a method that has multiple awaits in it. There's an await over here because I want to await the completion of a write operation. And there's an await down below where I'm awaiting the completion of a read operation. So this is just to say that this is very common and it is allowed. Um, what's common is having in a single method multiple await operators. So you'll notice the method is marked as async. You'll notice it returns a task because that's mandatory. But And you'll notice that I have multiple await operators in the method, and that does work, and it's a very, very common scenario. So I just wanted to point that out. What this code actually does is not important. Just what is important is that there are multiple awaits in here, and that's legal. Um, this is going to answer the question somebody asked, that if you're talking to a database, how can you hook into this functionality that I'm discussing? Well, on the SQL command class, they've added in .NET 4.5 these methods, execute database data reader async, execute non-query async, execute reader async, execute scal scalar async, and some others as well. So, again, if you look in the framework class library in .NET 4.5, all classes that have methods that do I.O. operations now have async versions of those methods. So on all stream-derived classes, like file stream, memory stream, crypto stream, network stream, and so on, they all now have read async, write async, flush async, copy to async. All these async methods create an ERP, send it down to the device driver, and return a task. Then you can decide whether to await the task or not. If you call wait on the task, then you will block for the operation to complete. If you call all wait on the task, then you will not block for the operation to complete. Um, on the text reader and its derived types, there's read async, read line async, read to end async, and so on. For text writer, there's write async, write line async, flush async. For HTTP client, get async, post async, put async, and so on. Then SQL command, I already said. And then if you use tools like service util utility, service util.exe, these tools that produce web service proxy classes, then the web service proxy classes will also have async methods on them. And every one of these async methods, they do the exact same thing. They create an IO request packet, they send it down to the device driver, and then they return a task. And then you decide what you want to do with the task. You want to block waiting for it. You want to await it. Of course, I would highly encourage you to await it, and I would strongly discourage you from blocking on it. I mean, that's the whole purpose of this, is so that you don't have to block threads. Okay. Um, let me see if there's some other questions here, and then I'll do something else in the slides. So where are my up to the questions? Um, Okay, so the book thing. Any suggestion of mechanism for sharing context across local calls spanning multiple threads as well as the logical context used previously, but it seems like legacy now. So the best thing to do is to not migrate state from one thread to another thread. That's why thread local storage is so bad, and then that doesn't migrate at all. Yes, the common language runtime has this other thing called logical call context, which I think is what you're referring to here, and that can migrate straight state from one thread to another. But it comes with some very significant performance impact, and so it's a really bad thing to do. And it's much better instead to be explicit about your state, and then you control what migrates when. And some of the problems with logical call context is what it does is it serializes and then deserializes the state. So it's making copies of the state as it moves it along. It's a very expensive thing to do. But that is the best mechanism that you have built in. But I would strongly encourage you to write code that avoids these mechanisms and that you control the state management yourself. You can do it much more efficiently. And then, and then you know exactly what's happening or not. I mentioned the SQL command supports async. Does Entity Framework also support it? So Entity Framework that's currently shipping does not. But what's currently in beta testing with Entity Framework, I think it's version 6.1, they have added the asynchronous support to it. So, um, and that's available for downloads today. 
So you can download the beta of, I think it's, I think it's version 6.1 of Entity Framework, and it will have the async support in it to do this. But it's not currently shipping yet. Is there a newer SQL helper that uses SQL command async methods? I don't know the answer to that. I'm not a database person myself, so database questions, I'm not the best one to um, answer those. Um, is, is it accurate? Is that accurate to state that for your code to benefit from any sync away concept, this needs to be propagated throughout the code layers, which Framework Engine and Halley Console app can use async await if it's not allowed? So the answer to that is yes. In order to really get benefit from async await, you have to start at the I.O. Or it's at the I.O. call is where you start. And then all methods that end up calling a method that does I.O., they have to become asynchronous as well in order for you to get the benefit. That is true. And a lot of people do complain that that is a lot of code churn in order to do that. But unfortunately, that is what you have to do in order to get the benefit of it. Now, the purpose of this stuff is to not block I.O. And the reason to not block I.O. is so that you can build scalable server applications and so you can build responsive client-side applications, really GUI applications. Your question is about console applications. And normally for console applications, we don't care about scalability and we don't care about responsiveness. And so normally in a console application, you would not be making everything async. And in fact, you can't make main async, so then it falls apart. Um, but you would do it for GUI applications, and you would do it for server-side applications. That's a good question. Um, there's a list of courses on your site, but no dates, locations. Are they all on demand? So there's the Wintelect website, where we offer courses where companies hire us, and then I come in and I teach in person. But there's also the new WintelectNow.com website, and that's where we offer the on-demand trading of recording videos. On that website, the videos for the threading stuff will not appear until May 30th. So you have another eight days before that stuff goes live. But right, that's wintelectnow.com. What about non-static methods using async await? If we access field members across and after the await, can we avoid synchronizing access to them? Um, So that depends. Um, that depends on, uh, there's no easy answer to that question. It depends on how the rest of your code is structured. Um, I have written many times classes that have instance fields in them, and then I go and access the instance fields from an, from an async method, and I do not require any uh, synchronization around the fields. The only time you would need fields is if multiple threads could access it simultaneously, and it would really depend on how you architect the code for that. Um, when Winelect Live, Winelect Now goes live on May 30th, I have a bunch of videos about thread synchronization, and I go into this exact kind of question uh, as to how to go and structure that code uh, to avoid the synchronization, and then if you can't structure it that way, then what is the best kind of synchronization to use? Is there going to be a recording of this presentation? Yes, I believe it is being recorded. Sync will async versus using Mars for serious parallel activity. Again, it's a database-related question, and I'm not the right person to answer that. In a scenario where you have uh, read multiple files from the same disk, does doing async I.O. help or hurt since there's only one disk to read ahead? It helps. Actually, it helps a lot. Um, because the device driver has this feature built into it when doing hard disk I.O.s, that it doesn't necessarily do them in a first-in, first-out order. So if you queue up a bunch of I.O. operations to the hard disk all at the same time and asynchronously, then whenever it wants to go and do the next one, it actually processes them in seek head order. So it'll reduce the amount of head seeking, and so you can actually get phenomenal performance improvements by doing this. In addition, it reduces wear and tear on the hard disk itself, so your hard disk is then well, it's likely to become um, less likely to become corrupted and have a hard disk crash or a hardware failure because of it. And that is built into the device driver for the hard drive. In .NET 4, I want to do async await for about 10 parallel tasks. And I'm assuming when you say tasks, you mean 10 parallel I.O. operations. How do I go about it? I understand begin and end, but how would I ensure all start in parallel? 
So there's never a way to ensure that they all start in parallel. You can queue up things, just like you can queue operations to the thread pool, but that doesn't guarantee that they're going to execute in parallel. You can queue up a bunch of I.O. requests to a device driver, but that does not guarantee that they're going to execute in parallel. Um, there's never a way to guarantee that things will execute in parallel. So you queue them up, and then they will execute as fast as possible. And then you need to find out the result of them. How are we doing on time? 11.23. Um, in a computer with SSG drivers, is there any advantage of using async I.O. operations? So, again, the answer is yes, there is. So you're not going to get the wear and tear improvement. and you're, um, So I'm assuming you just mean from your own application. Um, and the answer is still yes, because if your thread is blocking and it's a thread pool thread, then another thread would be created in the thread pool. And that's going to increase resource consumption. So even for an SSD drive, it totally makes sense to do everything asynchronously. Also, think of the case of a GUI app. The GUI thread would block waiting for the SSD drive to reply, and, um, and then the user can't use the UI. But also, let's not forget, you don't know whether you're using an SSD drive or not, right? The, when we write software, the software is going to run on lots of different computers, and some of them might be USB drives, some might be SSD drives, some might be whatever, and you should not be writing your code so that it only works efficiently on a particular kind of hardware. Okay, so um, I'm going to skip these next couple of slides because it takes me a long time to walk through them, and we are practically out of time. Um, I just I want to just say a couple more things really quick before we're all done. Um, you, if you want to learn more about how to implement servers asynchronously so that your server, servers really scale well, then if you're doing ASP.NET web form pages, then look up the async equal true page directive and this method called register async task. Right, these shit is part of the .NET framework. If you're doing an ASP.NET MVC controller, then you just need your controller to return a task of action result instead of action result. If you're doing an HTTP handler, then you would derive from HTTP task async handler, and you override the process request async method. And if you're using Windows Communication Foundation, then create your method as an async method and have it return a task, either task or task of T result. All right, I think at this point... Um, there are some other features which, you know, we just don't have time to go into. Um, there is like task when all, I'm doing these really quick, where you can do a bunch of I.O. requests and then you can find out when all of them have completed by awaiting a, the result of time task when all. There's also task when any, so you can continue processing as each one of a bunch of I.O. operation completes. So this code goes and makes 10,000 I.O. requests all at once, as fast as possible. And then the code here continues executing after all 10,000 are done. This version of the code creates all 10,000 tasks as quickly as possible, but then it processes them as each one goes and completes. All right. I think, I think at this point I'm going to stop um, here. And um, I can take any more questions, or we can close out the session. Let's see. What is the best way to get the UI thread to perform and invoke in a CPU-bound thread? I'm not exactly sure what that question means. So if you have a CPU-intensive operation, and you don't want to execute it on the GUI thread, which is a good idea, because the GUI thread would block during that time, then you should queue up the compute-bound operation to the thread pool, and you can use a task for that, and then call start on task, which is what queues it to the thread pool. And then when the thread pool is done executing it, then the, a thread pool thread can go and marshal it to the GUI thread, so the GUI can go and update itself. Um, I don't have time right now to go into all the details of how to do that. I do describe it in my book, and I do describe it in the videos that we'll be providing on May 30th. Where can I see a recording of this? I got caught up and I don't know. Um, you'll have to look at Libnub's website to see how they make these things available. Um, where will, support, will there be support on framework on 4.5 on Windows XP? I mean, I don't speak for Microsoft, but I have to believe the answer to that will be no. That is very unlikely that that will happen. Um, what could be a scenario where you want your WCF methods to return a task to the caller? 
So when you have a WCF method that returns a task, you are not returning the task to the client. You are returning your task back to the WCF infrastructure, and then it knows not to send a result back to the client, but then when the task completes, the infrastructure gets the result of the task, and then it sends that back to the client. So there's never a time when you would send a result, a task back to the client, but you would send a result, a task back to the infrastructure, so it knows when to send the result of the task back to the client. Um, how transaction scope can be used with a wait? Well, good question, and the answer is it cannot. So transaction scope is one of those things that I would say is horribly designed because it really uses thread local storage underneath the covers. And so transaction scope does not work with this mechanism at all. Um, so if you needed to use transaction scope, then you cannot use a wait um, in order to, to make it work. So that might be one of those cases where you want to execute that asynchronous operation, but then block the thread until it completes synchronously by calling that code I showed in the demo of get a waiter dot get result. And then you can make it work. All right, I can be done here. Hi, Jeff. Can I just uh, ping in there a little uh, second, mate? Sure. Um, I'm, I've just come online. I wasn't here for the first hour, but Brian wants to get away because he's been up early, so I'm taking over now. And since it's fresh pair of eyes, fresh set of hands, if you want to run over a little bit and do some more Q&As or go back through them slides you missed, that's absolutely fine. I don't have a problem with that. I see. Well, I don't think I'll do any more slides, but I can stay on for another few minutes and then do more Q&A. Well, that's, that's entirely up to you. <laughs> okay, well, that's, that's fine. So, uh, Shravins asks, is there a benefit of using a sync and wait features along with the new concurrent collections? And the answer is no. Um, there's really no benefit there at all. Um, thanks for the best presentation I've seen in years. Oh, well, thank you very much. I'm, uh, that's quite complimentary, and you're more than welcome. I love this stuff. Personally, I love this stuff. I have been doing it for more than 20 years of my life, this threading and thread synchronization and asynchronous I.O. and building scalable servers and responsive UIs and things like that. And um, I can't quite explain it myself, but I, I love this topic. So um, I'm glad that um, some of you are enjoying uh, the presentation. Could you possibly make the slides and code available? Um, yes, we can do that. I'll work it out with the Lidnug people to make that possible. Um, does anybody else have questions? Do you have a link to your book? Um, I mean, just, just do a search on Amazon for CLR and Richter, um, and you will find it. I mean, there's still a Bing or Google search for you know, CLR and Richter, and you'll find the book. It is easily available in many places. Yeah, it's definitely available on Amazon because I've bought a copy. Yeah. Um, if I have to call two begin and end methods and then do an update after both of them return, how do I do it? Um, I don't fully understand this question, so what I would recommend is that you email me and maybe flesh out the question a little bit more, maybe with some example code of what you're thinking, and then I'd be happy to look over your pseudocode and give you back some kind of response then. Right. I think I know what he means there, actually. Oh, yeah? Okay. Um, I, th I think what he's saying is he's got two async, uh, two async style procedures that he calls to do some updates, but yeah. the result of those two updates, both results need to be synced together to provide the final result. And he can't produce the result until both of them are finished. So how does he sync them to both finish at the same time? I see. Okay. And, uh, and if he's asking about begin and end, so if you were using the async methods in .NET 4.5, you would use the await task when all to accomplish that. If you're doing it with begin and end methods, then the best way to accomplish that is to create an integer, and set it to number two, because that's how many I.O. operations you have. Then in the end methods, when they get called, call interlock decrement to subtract one from the integer. And the, the result of interlock decrement, check the result of that, and if it is zero, then you know that both operations are done, and then you go and execute whatever code that you want now that you know that both operations are done. 
That's that's how you would pull that off. I don't know how well that's going to come across or be remembered over a phone conversation like this, but um, but again, if you email me, I can give you, and I do show that in my book too, actually. If you look at my book, I have a class called Async Coordinator, and the Async Coordinator does exactly what you're asking then, if, if that's correct, um, where you issue a bunch of I.O. operations, and it coordinates them and lets you know when they're all done, and then you can go and process the results. So look at that. Um, what is the benefit of using a sync await from a web server request thread? So the request thread will anyway need to block, need to be blocked, isn't it? No, the answer to that is no, absolutely not. So that is a very common misconception, though. A lot of people believe that when they build a server app, that the uh, the thread has to block in order before it can send the result back to the client, and that is absolutely not true. So, so um, you need the client request comes into the server. A thread pool thread wakes up. The thread pool then goes and executes some code. Now, if you execute that code asynchronously, which I would recommend, then the thread goes back to the pool, but it does not send the result back to the client. Meanwhile, the thread, since it's in the pool, it can process other client requests that are coming in, so you get to reuse the same thread over and over and over again, which is awesome. Then, when your task is done, then a thread pool thread gets the result out of the task and then sends it back to the client. But we do not, absolutely do not, have a thread blocking waiting for the task to complete. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, yes, I think that simplifies doing async processes for application developers. Thanks and bye. Goodbye. Um, Good, said that, did that one. Thank you very much. Can I write my own async methods using Win32 underneath rather than BCL methods? Yes, of course. Of course. Um, just as I was showing you the async methods, they all call a read file internally, which is the Win32 API. There's nothing stopping you from creating your own .NET class that P invokes out to Win32 and calls functions like read file or write file, and then they can leverage or hook into this entire mechanism absolutely. You can do all that yourself. Um, been reading your CLRs here since the second edition. Now Elias is fourth. Pleasure hearing you directly. A really compelling presentation. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, I have to call a Windows form into a separate thread task in a program that runs 24-7 in a server. The reason is that I do some other impersonation in this form to have forms and content localized. What is the best method to do it? I'm using... Um, I, the question's a little bit vague to me. I have to call a Windows Forms. So if you're building a Windows Form app, and it seems to me like you're basically creating one thread to do this thing, um, then you can just leave it that way. And your worst case scenario is you're just wasting one thread in the system. The, the problem really exacerbates itself when you start hooking into the thread pool because when thread pool threads block, then more thread pool threads get created, and then your memory consumption starts to skyrocket. But in your case here, you're not using the thread pool for this. And so if you just want to keep your code simple and easy, then and your worst case is you're maybe you know, not using, making the most efficient use of a thread, then maybe it's just fine to leave it alone. Um, I'm sure that I can come up with a solution that does this in a more um, more efficient fashion, but it would probably make the code a bit more complicated too, and I don't know if it's actually worth it for the for the small improvement. That would be up to you. So if you want to talk about that more, email me and I can converse more with you over email about it. My email address is Jeffrey R at Wintelect.com. Jeffrey R J E F F R E Y R at wintelect.com. Okay. Well, I don't see any more questions, so why don't we end it here? Yep, we'll leave it there. Okay. Um, I'm sure it was an absolutely excellent presentation. Like I say, I wasn't here for the first hour. Um, for all those who were asking, this will be recorded and put up on our YouTube page, as we usually do. Um, thanks again for attending. Um, we've got a load more of these Wintelect pairing ups this year as well as many other great quality presenters coming along in the very near future 
Um, we hope to see you all at the next one. And once again, Jeff, thanks very much for doing this. Oh, my pleasure. And on that note, we'll say good night.